Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the Planet checking account. It gives back 1% of the account's net revenue to the planet at no cost to you. There's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement, and there's no minimum balance required. The 1% for the Planet checking account, only from Bank of the West. Learn more at bankofthewest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. The Catalorette and Friends. From first love to happy ever after. What's that? From dating to dick pics. Oh, my. Oh, no. The Catalorette and Friends. <laughs> Oh, I love a good dick. This podcast contains sexual references, coarse language and adult themes from the beginning and throughout. It is not recommended for listeners under the age of 15. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to The Catchelorette and Friends. I'm your host, Carla Anita Matiazzo, and today's guest is Jewel Chenoweth. She's a photographer and she's been photographing love since 2010. Welcome to the podcast, Jewel. Hello, how are you? Yeah, good. How are you? Very, very well. Thank you for having me. I feel honoured. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you for coming on. So should we tell everybody how this happened? How did this all eventuate? You slid into my DMs like all good love stories these days Um, and mentioned um, probably one of my favourite love stories I've photographed over the years, the beautiful Vin and Joya. Um, You were talking to Joya recently about your podcast and she mentioned me. So here we are. Da, da, da. So, da, 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 da. Uh, good job, Fusco's. Good job. So, speaking yeah, of the Fusco's, Fusco's win again. Love it. <laughs> speaking of the Fusco's, uh, for mm. the listeners who do not know, Vince and I have been mates since oh, we were about 15. Uh, and he's mm. obviously, as most of you know, he's the director of my last two cabaret shows. And then Joya has also become part of my family, just as Vince has done. So let's start there. Let's talk a little bit about their love journey and your involvement in it. No, oh, it was so sweet. I just put a call out several years ago uh, looking for a couple to um, model for me, you know, back in my baby photographer days. I just wanted some extra experience. And Vin put his hand up and said, I'm newly dating this girl and she's amazing. She's lovely and she's keen as well. So fresh in their sort of dating life, they come up wow. and modeled for me. Um, And of course, they were beautiful. They were so disgustingly in love. You've met them. You know all about it. It was right from the very beginning. It was just perfect. You know, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. So from that point in time, that was, um, you know, when they were first dating, I then had the privilege of photographing the proposal um, and knew all about the ring and the plans and things like that, which was awesome. Um, and then, yeah, I did the engagement photos after the proposal and then the wedding and then maternity and then newborn. So over the last few years, I photographed them a number of times and had the privilege of watching their love grow and blossom and now multiply a couple of times. Very awesome. That's, um, yeah, that's been a real privilege of my career is to follow people um, through their journeys in life like that. They'd be really easy to photograph because they're quite aesthetically pleasing to the eyeballs. <laughs> Beautiful people. I mean, can you get any better than beautiful people madly in love? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're a dream client, honestly. Yeah, and the, yeah, the pair of them are just stunning individually. You know, so warm, so kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. So, what got you into photography in the first place, and love in particular? Love was not the motivation for sure. It was definitely um, just something I was good at photography, something Mm -hmm. I kind of enjoyed on the side of uni back in the days. It just kind of grew. So discovering what I liked and what I didn't like, you know, you have to do all the crap stuff. Um, So I photographed Mm -hmm. cars and real estate and events, 21st, nightclubs, you know, all that sort of Mm -hmm. stuff. But there's nothing like a wedding. 
there is absolutely nothing like a wedding. There is so much beauty and love in a wedding. I love the ritual, the ritualistic nature of it. I love the commitment, the ceremony, um, you know, people coming together, families coming together, dressing the man, dressing the woman, you know, bringing it all together with generations of people supporting them. I, as I said, it, this wasn't the motivation when I started, but it was a hundred percent the motivation moving forward. <laughs> That's you know, there gorgeous. Is, yeah. I've fallen in love with love. Um, as you can probably tell by my love heart earrings, <laughs> second pair I've worn today, actually. But yeah, I've, I just fell in love with love. There's just nothing like a wedding. Seeing love between generations, between family, between friends, and of course, between the, the two people getting married. It's such a privilege to be able to be um, a witness to that and then to photograph it and sort of, I say, harvest it out of time and into forever. Oh, that's um, so good. I know, that, one, that one's actually from Tyler Brown in Perth, so I'll have to hit him up and be like, hey, Tyler. Um, so yeah, harvesting a moment out of time and into forever um, and then multiplying it by making that a tangible print you can hold in your hand. And of course, there's something so dreamy and romantic thinking about mm. my clients old and grey and they're you know, arm in arm and they're holding their album in front of them and looking back on that day and, and my art. I mean, that's That's, that's very precious. A, yeah, that's oh, precious. It's incredible. I tell people that I've, um, you know, I'll never buy a lotto ticket because I've won the lotto doing this. Guess what, lovers? The Catchalorette, there's always a catch, is back on stage in 2021. First up, The Mill, Adelaide Fringe Festival, from the 18th to the 28th of February, 7.30. Tickets on sale at the Adelaide Fringe website. People come and see you. Do they Mm. have a particular aesthetic that they speak to um, when they come and see you or do they approach you because they already like your style of photography? How does that all, you know, happen? Yeah, so I think these days, um, you know, I'm very set in the kind of work that I like to produce. I like really, you know, bright, clean, clear images, very true to life. And then everything that I do is I'm always looking for those candid moments and inspiring vulnerability and finding that those really beautiful pockets of love that are unique to my couples. Um, And I think that's something, you know, pairing the uniqueness of the love of each of my couples and their wedding days with my style. I think that's what people come to me for now. Yeah. Brilliant. I hope you're enjoying this episode of The Catchalorette and Friends. Make sure you follow the podcast at The Catchalorette Pod on Instagram. And if you think your love journey is worth sharing with me on the podcast, send me an email, thecatchalorettepod at gmail.com or slide into my Instagram DMs. Oh, and don't forget to give the podcast a review and tell all your motherfucking people to listen to the show. Now let's get back to this episode. I had to have a little bit of a break after my own heart got broken. Oh, darling. Because there is nothing worse than being a wedding photographer and having a broken heart. Yeah, how do you fucking manage that? Well, you know the opening of Bridget Jones? Yes. You know, she's like wailing and singing, you know, all by myself. You probably do that better than I can. But she's got the bottle of wine, the giant undies, and she's an absolute mess. It was pretty much that. Um, But then... There's something magical about my camera. It's it's such a coat of armour. So between, uh, you know, bride prep and ceremony, you have a little cry in the car and touch up your makeup and then off you go and do it again oh, for the greater good. Oh, so. But, yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. How did, how did you get yourself out of heartbreak? What is in your tool mm. that gets mm. you out of heartbreak? I think my favourite one was actually the year of yes. So... Okay. The first time I was really in love with a woman and really could see myself marrying this woman Mm -hmm. and it didn't end uh, very well, obviously it ended very, um, yeah, it ended and it was, it was very, very hard for a long time. Um, I needed to challenge myself. I needed to push myself. And so I took this theory of the year of yes and ran with it. I made everyone accountable around me to keep myself accountable. Anything that, 
I was asked I had to do except if it impacted my health, my finances or my job. So wow. any invite to any sports game, uh, you know, up the river, jet skiing, whatever it was, um, trips to Melbourne and things, tattoos, oh, my God, I said yes. Amazing. And yeah, it was just such a good distraction and such a way to sort of make myself just that tiny bit uncomfortable and keep that progression moving forward. So that's probably something that um, if I can give anyone that's got a broken heart a bit of advice is, you know, lean into something that's uncomfortable, do something that's a bit different. Um, and then the most recent one, the most recent heartache, my fiance left me and uh, I decided to tackle things that um, I'm afraid of. So uh, I haven't done my number one yet, which will be swimming with great white sharks out of Port Lincoln. Wow. But number two on the list was to go skydiving. And you did that? Wow. Amazing. Yeah, I, I did. And I think I'm now up to number five jump. So yeah, I love it. Oh yeah. my God. I know, mad, right? It's so good. <laughs> We should go. <laughs> Dude, I'd be terrified. I know. I was totally shitting myself. Um, oh, yeah, see, it's not really like a height. Like if you can look out of an aeroplane window when you're at a decent height and not feel afraid, then you'll be fine to jump out of a plane, I reckon. Oh, yes. Your yes. face looks terrified right now. <laughs> I think I can picture me jumping out and just vomiting everywhere and it like going, yeah. nah. nah. Yeah, I 100% thought I was going to wet myself, shit myself, pass out, cry, you name it. I thought I was going to have the whole works. But, um, yeah, I've got a little tattoo from it. So what I said to myself was um, nice. just surrender. On the edge of the plane, guys strapped behind you and they count to like one, two, three, but they really only count to two. And I thought to myself, just surrender to it, surrender to the fear. You know, I've spent months wailing in heartache, mm. um, feeling miserable, you know, having yeah. to shoot weddings with a broken heart was terrible. And exactly. so while you're at 15,000 feet with an aeroplane door open, you just kind of go, well, here we go. Here we go. Fear is an interesting thing because fear really cripples us from doing a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, fear of rejection I know is a big thing and I think that's part of the reason I've stayed single for so long mm -hmm. is because of that fear of rejection um, so fear does cripple us and does oh, yeah. you know, box us in um, to our mm. lives uh, like in a certain way it sounds like you need to jump out of an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Know, absolutely. Absolutely. And that all comes into the science of love as well. So um, when we're experiencing love, it actually is setting off the, the same uh, area of the brain that's to do with addiction. So oh. that's, um, yeah, some scientists have put people in love and with broken hearts into functional MRI machines and studied what's actually going on when you're in love. So love can be likened to drug addiction. It makes you obsessive, possessive, wanting. It makes you take huge risks, um, you know, because you want those huge gains. But it also, yeah. yeah, you're willing to take those massive risks. It's, um, yeah, super interesting, actually. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because just listening to you uh, unpack a little bit of what the MRIs show when people are mm. in different states. And I think just reflecting back on my experience, it makes so much sense as to why I have not taken that leap because, mm. one, there hasn't been anyone that I feel I've had a connection with and if I don't have the mental connection, um, intellectual connection, mm -hmm. it's a no go. I just can't go there. But I think yes, they call that demisexual. Is that what that is? Demi demisexual? Ah. Where you need an emotional attachment to someone before forming a physical attraction? Demisexual. Yeah. So I can't, my motor doesn't get running unless yep. there's an intellectual yep. compatibility. Yeah. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, romantic love is definitely one of those things that is super, super fascinating. And one of my favourite um, TED talkers, you know, scientists that's been studying um, love and vulnerability is Brene Brown. I don't know if you've heard of her. Maybe yes. you could 
have a little look on her um, tales of vulnerability or studies on vulnerability, um, yeah, right, which yeah. plays plays a massive part in love and that risk taking. Um, and then, of course, you know, being vulnerable in a relationship then allows you to have that open communication, that trust, that understanding, that mutual building of those those feelings. Um, but yeah, love is pretty much like a drug addiction. It's centered. I can't remember the name of the um, bit in your brain, but it is. It's uh, the reptilian core. She called it. Um, Dr. Helen Fisher. Her name is. It's an addiction, and it's to do with um, tolerance, which is wanting more, and then withdrawals. So when someone leaves you, you want them back, and having those withdrawals, and then the relapse as well is another big one. And it all comes from that same part of the brain that fires off when we're dealing with love. So is that why it's so hard to have a clean break, especially when you have had a long relationship? And I know that I've found that I've literally had to internally tell myself, no, do not Mm -hmm. contact that person. They are no longer in your life that you need to delete, block, whatever, so that you cannot access those people. Yeah, absolutely. Because you want that hit again. You want that dopamine and serotonin hit like as quickly as you can get it. And because of the part of the brain that it's in, um, if you haven't had enough experience in romantic love, it's going to lead you to be obsessive and possessive and maybe take risks and do things that you wouldn't normally do. It's very interesting, actually. So would you say then on that note, Mm -hmm. I always think it's quite important for people to have those training wheel relationships as teenagers so that they can work out what their boundaries are, um, where their self-worth lies and Mm -hmm. how they function like baby steps instead of going to no relationships and then to jumping into something, say, in your mid to late uh, 20s 30s whatever it is and everybody's journey mm-hmm. is different I totally understand mm-hmm. that and I'm I'm not judging by any means but just on what you were saying there it mm-hmm. makes more sense for people to take those little steps younger than leaving it until they're older and then making mm-hmm. a big shit storm that doesn't need to be a shit storm yeah absolutely those those early relationships are yeah for training wheels they're for practice Um, I've always spoken about the pendulum swinging. So in one relationship, the pendulum swings to one side where you're really, um, let's say possessive, you know, you really want to be with this person all the time. You sort of take it to the extremes. We're talking about young love, that really silly, all encompassing, um, obsessive love. But when that relationship breaks down, you would hope, or I should hope that you learn from that. And so the pendulum will swing back the other way into the next love, um, which hopefully maybe after that, you'll get the pendulum to stop and just be in the middle where you can have a healthy balance of obsession, but also not like you need to crave someone and want someone that is a part of love. That is a part of the part of the brain that, that fires off when we are in love. But if you take it to an extreme, it is going to be really unhealthy. And I think the only way that you can really learn that is through experience and it, and it doesn't have to be first-hand experience. Like you said, this is, this is a pretty broad topic here. We're talking about every human on the planet ever. Um, (laughs) you know, like in the history of the world, like love has been around for, um, thousands of years there's some beautiful tales of love throughout history but um yeah I really believe that those early relationships are what is going to help you discover what's a healthy balance um in the relationship that you want for yourself that's going to be serving of yourself and then serving of the the other person that you're with There's so many great love stories uh, in history. What are your favourites? Oh, gosh, one of my favourites. There was a Mayan, um, oh, I don't think he was a priest, actually. I can't remember. But in, yeah, back in the Mayan day, so I think we're talking 2,000 years, there was a man and he built um, this beautiful monument and 
he loved his wife for something like 70 years and he loved her so much that he built an identical monument directly opposite his so that when the equinox uh, occurs in the morning her monument sits exactly in the shadow of his and then at the other end of the day at sunset um, her monu uh, his monument sits in the shadow of hers wow so something that's 2000 years old that so romantic. Is beautiful yeah um the taj mahal is another one that was another um massive building you know out of love for another person um i think they're probably my two two favorites i think yeah so where yeah. are the people these days that are building big buildings in dedication <laughs> to the people that they love when did that stop mm. happening i think they should bring that back <laughs> I think we are talking about 2,000 years ago and a lot happens in 2,000 years. So that, that love does still exist and I, I am in a privileged spot to see it. And I think um, another one of my favourite love stories is the front page of my website is a black and white photograph of um, someone called uh, the couple Tiff and Ryan. And they have one of those love stories where I think if one of them was in power in the Mayan era, they would have built a monument for each other 100%, <laughs> without a doubt. But, but the love stories, they come out in the cabaret shows, in the songs, you know, the John Legend songs, you know, the Ed Sheerans, any musician that's ever been in love. I've been in love with a musician who wrote songs about me and, and falling in love with me. Um, so love is still all around us. We've just sort of changed the way that the world works. So those signs of love have become um, smaller, maybe, you know, no less significant, um, but smaller in scale globally, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you feel the different connections each of the couples have that you mm -hmm. photograph? Is each wedding a very different feel? Because I know mm -hmm. going to a plethora of weddings myself, each wedding has a very fucking different feel. You can feel the ones that you're like, oh, why the fuck are you guys getting married? And then you can feel the ones that you're like, yes, these two people are supposed to be together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I have spent yeah, almost 11 years with a front row seat, um, inspiring vulnerability to inspire loving moments in front of my camera mm -hmm. in a very intimate setting. So, you know, at sunset, I pull the couple out, we go and find somewhere really beautiful. I'll walk them through a little bit of yoga breathing just to calm them down, center them, get them to connect physically, close their eyes, breathe in sync with one another and really, really unguard them together um, and then to comfort one another and express and show love. Now that's as specific as I get. People show love in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. People show love with humor, poking fun at each other. They'll make jokes. Others are very tender and soft and embrace for a really long time actually some couples I just have to turn and walk away and leave them be because they're just having a beautiful little moment and yeah. once I've got my shot I leave them to it because it's their wedding day be in that moment guys you know That's but it is gorgeous oh yeah my job's pretty cool but absolutely the spectrum of love is huge I liken love to being like a uh, a fingerprint or a snowflake or a diamond it's so multifaceted and so unique um you know yeah no two really are alike and i think that's probably been something that i've learned most in the last two years is really opening my eyes up to the variety of love and intimacy and connection um, and there isn't a right or wrong that's really interesting that's really interesting. That's gorgeous. That's really good. Cool. Touching on what we know from the Hollywood era, you know, these rom coms mm -hmm. that we, you know, the girl needs rescuing and here comes this beautiful man yeah. and oh, la, 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 right? All that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a certain way, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Real love could not be further from the truth. Um, you know, you don't have to be a total PDA loving, affectionate couple to be solidly and truly in love mm -hmm. um you know there's there's a, a massive spectrum of it and it is 
It's all beautiful. I didn't realize. And so, you know, in these last couple of years, for me, realizing that I've, you know, you have to resign that Hollywood dream. Mm-hmm. And there is comfort in it as well to those that have always looked up to that Hollywood rom-com. Yeah, that pedestal. The comforting, yeah, the pedestal. The comforting side of it is, is that love is so unique. It is so, so unique. Couples express and show and feel love in such unique ways. That's really gorgeous, <laughs> Jill. This is, I'm learning a lot. I'm loving I'm, this perspective. I'm glad. I'm really, really glad. I'm loving this perspective. <laughs> So to bring the listeners up to speed, this podcast is based on the award-winning cabaret show, The Catchalorette, There's Always a Catch, where I talk and sing about my first crush to happy ever after and everything in between. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your first crush. Can you remember your first crush and the story around that? Yeah, well, I have a couple actually. Mm -hmm. Um, My first obvious and out loud crush was to a boy and I think I was in yeah, probably year eight or nine, he showed no interest in me and, you know, my best friend and his best friend were into each other and so there was a bit of note swapping and that sort of thing. <laughs> That's as far as it went. Um, but in my later years, I sort of was able to reflect on my sexuality mm-hmm. and I think my first female crush, crush was probably my year eight art teacher. I didn't realise at the time what that bond meant and what the difference because you're supposed to like boys and you're supposed to act a certain way and liking boys at that age yeah. and so I didn't recognise the um, attraction and feeling and, and um, you know, that I had for my art teacher so, yeah, there was kind of, kind of both of those at the same time, but I didn't know until much later in life that that's so what, what that relationship was. What was it that made you have that light bulb moment about your art teacher? I'm, I'm learning that, learning my bisexuality and my, my um, fluidity on my sexuality over the, the course of my life, it did take a lot of self-reflection and you do look back and you look at all of the relationships, you know, the friendships, you know, where there are different boundaries to other friendships. You know, when you have a friend, you don't look at them the same way as when you've got this um, part of your brain lighting up, which is the obsessive possessive, this same part of your brain that goes off when you're having cocaine. Um, at that age, you just don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, you just kind of go, oh, this art teacher's amazing and she's so beautiful and I can't wait to go to art class and I want to hang around and talk to her afterwards. But, um, yeah, it was probably like a whole life journey. I don't think there was one particular moment that I realised that that's what it was. I think, yeah, getting the opportunity to stop and look back and reflect, there, there were lots of those little things over the course of my life and I think that's like with um you know learning how you give and receive love you know like yourself you have said that you will only uh, you're only open to receiving love after you've created that emotional and trusting connection with someone yeah (laughs) yeah which that's kind of not how it works in a Hollywood movie you're supposed to just lock eyes and it goes oh you know, yeah, the, the, the meat cute, mm-hmm. fireworks and oh, the flash mobs and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't always work like that for us and it doesn't always work like that for anyone, you know. Correct. If you worked out that you were attracted to women a bit later on in life, then you had your training wheel relationships with boys? I actually had my training real, real, real relationships with both. I was oh. in such a privileged position. I have um, quite progressive and open parents who had gay and lesbian yeah, friends awesome. my whole life. Yeah, yeah. So I'm one of the very, very privileged and lucky ones. I had no coming out. I had no fear in my sexuality. So my first love was a boy. And then my second love was a girl. Um, and then I sort of switched sides since and I'm kind of still switching around as I see fit, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's good. Yeah. And that, to me, that says you fall in love with the person, not... Mm-hmm. I've always said that, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Totally. Society prefers people to fit into certain boxes and bisexuality mm-hmm doesn't really fit into a neat and tidy box. Have you mm-hmm. ever com- been confronted by people that are not able to process mm-hmm. oh, those two things? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. And I've been on the other side as well. The, the, the bi phobia or the bi shaming, you know, when I identified as straight and then when I identified as gay um, and I have now, you know, sort of switched over into um, somewhere between pansexual, demisexual and bisexual. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I have been on, on both sides, the bi stigma and shame. I, I think it is just really because, you know, we're only supposed to love one side. You're only supposed to be attracted to one side, but that is 100% not the case. It's, it's couldn't be further from the truth. You know, you're attracted to so much more than just a body part. Um, yes. You know, there's so much that goes into, you know, your socioeconomic background, your intelligence, your um, facial features. Um, I don't know if you've seen on Instagram, there's a, a page called Siblings or Dating, which is very interesting. Which you no. Should go around. Oh. What's it <laughs> called? Sibling, siblings or Dating. Okay. And they post oh. photos of couples or siblings and they look so similar that you kind of can't guess. And they do the poll on Instagram. It's always at like 48, 52%. You can never tell. And I'm always wrong. <laughs> but, you know, there are lots of, lots of different things that, that play into your attraction to someone. Um, the stigma is moving away, I think. From, from my experience over the last 10 years, it, it is all slowly, slowly dissipating into just the general acceptance of the fluidity and the openness and you know, the Gen Zs and Gen Ys coming up. I take my hat off to them for really standing their ground and, and being who they are. Yeah, I agree with that. They definitely have a more open and accepting perspective on a lot of things and are quite comfortable in pointing out when people are being closed minded or, mm-hmm. you know, along yeah, those absolutely. lines. I think it's fantastic that you didn't have to have that conversation with your parents mm-hmm. about your sexuality. I am I think so, that's amazing. so privileged and lucky. And, and I, that's why I think I take my um, position in the queer community very seriously in that if I can help someone else in the queer community, I always will because I am from a position of privilege. I didn't have the fear of losing my home at 15 or 16 and losing my connection with my family. Um, you know, trans kids and queer kids have much higher rates of suicide um, you know, so where I can, I make sure that I return that privilege um, back into the community and always, you know, there's so many rainbows all over my house. I wear rainbow badges. I've got a rainbow neon light. Yeah, you know. look, I've got, I've got one on my desk. Oh, yay. My desk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ally, beautiful. Oh, yes. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, that was pure luck, I think. You know, who, who you're born to and where you're born and where you grow up is, is purely luck. I got really lucky. My parents were pretty awesome. Um, I do remember being a kid and, you know, being told uh, after my parents had a dinner party, you know, you can't go to school and talk about, you know, Ronnie and her girlfriend and Jake and his boyfriend. Like you can't talk about that at school. And I remember that being the only time that I sort of was like, oh, this is a bit weird. What's this about? Yeah. Why Um, can't I? Yeah. Yeah. And then from that point, I mean, that was probably, I was like maybe eight or nine, from there, the next time I felt any kind of hurt and pain about my sexuality was the marriage equality debate a couple of years ago. Yeah, tell me like, how you felt about that because obviously that was way overdue. <sighs> but in my mind and because, like, what I can't really speak on it, but in my mind I was thinking who are we as a country to vote mm. on people's personal fucking lives. It should just already be an automated thing. Why the fuck are we voting on this? Yeah, it's pretty wild to me. I'm being a wedding photographer and shooting weddings for years at this point in time. I have shot maybe one or two same-sex weddings, uh, weddings in inverted commas because they weren't legal at that point. But then, to, yeah, to be shooting weddings and to go home to my girlfriend at the time and having the whole country debating whether or not we would be able to marry one another was it was heartbreaking yeah Yeah, it was it was I mean I I cried so much you know I rallied so much I you know put all sorts of things in my neighborhood letterboxes just saying like you've never met me you don't know me we live in the same street suburb whatever I don't know what goes on in your house 
Yeah. You don't know what goes on in my house. As long as it's safe, consensual and loving, then what's the matter? Yeah. Yeah. A pretty wild time, actually. It caused a lot of pain for a lot of people and it was such a waste of fucking money, to be quite honest. Yes. Um, But obviously the result has been awesome. (laughs) We love the outcome. Big fat yes from me still. Yeah. Absolutely. Love is love, baby. It was, it was really hard. I mean, especially in my job, it was, it's my job to go to weddings and go to wedding ceremonies where there's that legal bit that they have to say there's, you know, between a man and a woman. And for a little while there, that just stung. Every time I heard it, it stung. But the first time I got to hear the new script of it being between, you know, two people and the cheers from the people at the wedding and, you know, just the eruption of celebration and love around the country. And for all of those weddings, you know, probably for about six months, people clapped and cheered when that was said in ceremonies. And to be a part of that in our history, Mm -hmm. you know, is is something that I will hold really, really dear to me. And it's a story that as, you know, someone in the queer community, I will continue to tell and continue to make sure that I'm advocating for the right things. You should write a book. There is one in the works. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Good. Because this needs to be, we need history around around this. Because I feel like there is not enough um, her story or histories about... Queer people in general. I mean, one of the things that just absolutely drives me crazy, I've had a love of art my whole life. I've been an art student all through, you know, my schooling and still consider myself a student of art. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how many plays, paintings, sculptures, poems we don't know about and will never know about because the cis white men of the time called it witchcraft, burnt it, yep. you know, punished these women for having any kind of creative expression. <sighs> what, are, you know, what could we possibly be missing in life? And we get so much out of art and it, to, to be missing this huge chunk of human civilization and where we've come from is, is absolutely devastating to me. But is- that's why we've got to make sure that moving forward, you know, we do make sure that the women are on the front line and we're doing, you know, inclusivity across, you know, all abilities and people of colour and everything. All of the stories are important to us. Correct. Yeah. Right. All the stories are. And that's something that I really Mm. love um, about this podcast is hearing everybody's stories. Because as you were saying before, Mm. everybody's love journey is very different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, depending on people's backgrounds, depending on their experiences, their worldviews, how they were brought up, their culture. Yeah. There's so much stuff that plays into how people express love, how mm-hmm. they um, get into relationships and all those wonderful things. We would be doing a disservice to the world to cut those things out just because someone's black or just because someone's a lesbian or just because someone's trans, it, whatever mm-hmm. people are. And it's so interesting that you say that about art. We would have missed so much fucking stuff. Like <laughs> if we're real, we would have missed so much stuff. Probably uh, half of it you might say. Yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah, <laughs> probably half, and that's why. Like, I normally I'm not, I'm not really huge on technology. I'll try not to have my phone on me. But platforms like um, Instagram, TikTok, podcasts, YouTube. You know, back in the day when I first got Instagram, there was not a gay couple for me to follow anywhere. Now yeah. I follow all of them. The Broadway <laughs> husbands are amazing. You know, um, the, the gaby babies and all of those things like these people getting to have that platform and having more people expressing themselves and their own lives and their love and the differences and diversity. I mean, we're really in uncharted territory. So I'm really excited to see what happens with, with love in human history. Now that we've got all of this extra, you know, connectivity. Yeah, look, I think the trajectory should be wide and safe mm. and glorious. Mm, I think consensual, I've, safe, beautiful. Yes, and I think 
us in Australia, we do have that privilege to a certain extent. Um, Obviously, we can only speak on our personal experiences, but Mm -hmm. I would hope moving forward everywhere in the world that people are able to be free and safe with exactly who they are, who they choose to love. Mm. Yes, I would hope that would be the case. It's um, it's a pretty strange feeling to be. I remember this this one time just outside of Queensland in Victoria, my girlfriend at the time and I walked into a shopping centre there. We were obviously from Adelaide. We were there for um, a summer holiday, mm-hmm. and the looks and stares we got just holding hands because we're in a regional town in Victoria. This is obviously not as progressive as like Melbourne City and we're yeah, right. a little bit far from home in Adelaide as well. The stares and the sense of fear, like having to let go of her hand, you know, something so simple, just just holding hands in a shopping centre, you know, walking towards the Woolworths, past the butchers, and there are all these people just stopping, staring, furrowing their brows, and you just you just have this fear inside of you. And I still don't understand what that was about. Why would you make someone feel so uncomfortable to hold someone else's hand, which is a way of expressing security and comfort and love and trust between two people that has nothing to do with you. Correct. You know, that makes no sense to me. Yeah. I think it's, I reckon it's a lot of it would be ignorance. Oh yeah. Like obviously if there was a lesbian couple living within that community, people would have been exposed to that and there would not have been those responses. Oh, yeah. To me, that's all I can hear there is a lot of ignorance and a lot of um, passed down generations of stereotyping and not educating themselves enough on on not leaving the fucking country town because I'm a very tactile person I'm Italian and French uh, background, like my grandparents are all from Europe. Mm -hmm. And I am affectionate with the people that I care about, Mm -hmm. irrespective of if I'm attracted to them or not, men Mm -hmm. or women, I touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, COVID's changed that a little bit because you've got to be careful with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. However, I'm... I've always been quite comfortable with girls or boys, arm around them, linking arms, holding hands. I don't, it's not, it's never been a thing for me. It's always been, I love this person. Love to me is affection. Mm -hmm. Like showing love to me is being tactile, Mm -hmm. hands-on. And obviously Italians are quite affectionate. We grab everybody and we kiss everybody. So like, Mm. it's... Yeah, and that's even between um, in my family, the boys in my family, when they used to see each other, they give each other a hug and a kiss on mm-hmm. both cheeks or whatever. Like that's always been a part of my existence. So when there's been a pushback recently, probably six months ago, I was hanging out uh, with some uh, colleagues of mine, ex colleagues of mine, um, outside of work hours, and uh, the fact that I was really tactile with one of my closest uni friends who I hadn't seen in like three years, and he happened to be at the same pub, and I and we were holding hands, arm around each other, big mm-hmm. kisses, beautiful, um, and that's just how our relationship is as friends, and we've always been like that. Mm -hmm. And then I had two people, when Steve left, I had two people give me the inquisition about, because they obviously at work, I was, I wasn't affectionate. At work. Yeah, you were at work. work. (laughs) Um, But uh, people seeing me in my normal form as my natural, Mm -hmm. in my natural state rather, was very confronting for some people and Mm. to have to justify this is what I'm like when I'm not at work and we're mates and why am I having to explain this? Mm. Why, Why am I having to explain this? You should never need to have to explain to anyone giving or receiving consensual love and affection. 
Mm -hmm. Like period, full stop. We need more love and affection and kindness, consensual, obviously. I mean, as humans, it's, it's the most powerful thing in the world. It's, we fought wars over it, you know, over love. Love is something that is so just important to us as human beings. We need it to survive and thrive and grow. And then in the right forms, it can actually lead us to do brilliant things. I think, honestly, if you are loved in the right way by the right person at the right times, you are invincible. And yes. you have the power to do absolutely anything. And that is the power of love. Bless Celine Dion and that song. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true because when I, more of it. I think so, when I see in my mind's eye what I hope to be the type of relationship that I end up with mm. for the rest of my life, because I'm at an age where I'm not interested in flings. I'm not, I'm not good with the casual stuff. I get mm-hmm. invested. My, I'm very much an open heart. Once I make a decision about, oh, I like this person, then it's mm-hmm. game on. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very similar, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm just mm-hmm. not at the stage where I have found myself being shamed a lot by guys when, say, for example, I've dabbled in the dating apps for research mainly for my show, but, yes, I will admit, I wanted to awesome. see if this thing actually worked. They mm-hmm. don't, from my experience. Um, dating apps? Yeah. Oh, um, there's a science to that. There's an art to that. Oh, is there? We'll get into uh-huh. that in a second. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being on different timelines. There's nothing wrong with that. But for some reason, the dudes that I've encountered have been very quick to shame that I'm at that stage in my life. At the stage of wanting something serious? Yeah. And wanting potentially to get married and potentially to have kids. Like that's always been very, oh, well, you're desperate oh, God, you're clucky or whatever it is or, oh, you're crazy for wanting that. Well, I'm in my mid-30s. No, I'm not. Like, this just, I think this just comes back to, like, the, the understanding. There's a huge spectrum. I've got a friend that doesn't want to have kids and she receives a lot of flack for that. Um, I've got friends that don't want to get married and they don't believe in the institution of marriage. Yes. I think, you know, those people are obviously just dickheads. <laughs> Like these people that you're talking to that are shaming you for this, they're obviously just dickheads oh, yeah. that you need to, you know, just keep, just delete those ones and, and move on from them. But it, I mean, that just comes back to, you know, the, the, you know, if you're not 24 and you're looking for love and marriage and settling down, then you're a, yeah, then you're a desperate, whatever, dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, it, it's completely ridiculous and stupid and unfair. And again, bring it up for the Gen Zers and Gen Ys that are throwing that shit out the window. They're making it up as they go along and trial and error, um, designing their own lives. And that's exactly how it should be for you. You should design your own life for yourself. Correct. And the right person will fit beautifully as an embellishment on your already stunning crown. Oh, thank you, my dear. That's what I like Mm. to think of the inside. Yeah, I just, I'm very, and I've mentioned this on other podcasts before, I'm very much about the hero team together, two individuals being content and happy with their own existence and coming together Mm -hmm. as a fantastic team rather than this bullshit of half a person, half a person, and then you come together as the whole person. No, I can't stand yeah. that shit. Nah, I did away, did away with the half and half a long, long time yeah. ago. Because, yeah, you do need to be like a, a whole, complete person. And I like to think of relationships or a healthy relationship being that, you know, when you drop below your 100%, even if it's only down to 80%, that that partner is there and they can compensate for you and bring you back up to that 100% whilst you're bringing yourself back up to that 100%. That's what I think a healthy relationship should should be like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They should compliment. Mm-hmm. Hold out for it, girl. Hold out for it. Five years and counting. I'm holding out for it. I'm holding out for it, Jill. <laughs> Just keep keep those fringe shows coming, babe. Keep us all entertained in the meantime. We're loving it. <laughs> 
So can you tell me a bit about the online dating? Because I'm not on online dating anymore. It actually gives me way mm. too much anxiety. And one, is boring. And two, it just makes me feel very much less than. So oh, yeah. those things, I was like, this is not, not my jam. And I'm definitely one who want love to come organically, not forcing it. So mm-hmm. for those out there that are still on online dating what's the science i mean this is this is just my experience and my observation um but dating has changed so much with technology so i remember you know you'd have to give someone their your phone number when we were at school right you're about my age mid 30s you know and then your phone would ring and they'd leave a message right now you've got you've kind of got to sit on an app and swipe for someone who's five photos display who they want to display themselves as Mm -hmm. and for someone like yourself you have to go on that initial attraction but it's an attraction to a digital image correct right it's not an attraction to someone's um, aura, pheromones, energy, tone of voice, um, yep. which all play into the science of love. Yep. So you have to approach um, online dating differently. It isn't the same ball game that we grew up with. It's a different sport. Uh, I'm with you. I would much rather run into someone um, spinning around a dance floor and be swept off my feet that way right. um, than sit on a nap and swipe for someone. I think if you are someone that's subscribing to that at the moment, and yeah, I'm on, I'm on all the dating apps. Um, the different dating apps have different kind of meanings. I think, um, I can't remember who it was you were talking to, but they were talking about like Grinder versus Bumble maybe or something. Was that Alex was Leah. or was that Harry? It might have been Harry and Leah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So the different dating apps have different things. So like Tinder is your hookup. Um, there's a couple of lesbian ones as well called Her. Um bumble and hinge um and there are more serious ones and and there are less serious ones so you kind of have to know that from the get-go and then the science behind it is knowing how you um go into and accept love so if you're a little bit similar to me you might need to be someone that sort of takes that risk goes on a few dates you know five or six and then you decide but that's a really big time investment Mm. um which a lot of people don't want to do but it's never going to be the same as when you meet someone in a bar or, you know, you see someone over, you know, over the room and go, Oh, lock eyes with them. I've got to speak to them. And it's, it is different. It happens differently. Um, and understanding those sort of different journeys into love through those different avenues, I think is what we need a little bit more, um, you know, a few more Cosmo articles on it. I think. Yes, I agree. Um, I agree. Want another BuzzFeed article or <laughs> a Vice video or something. Yeah. Just explaining like that it is, it's a really different game. It's a different sport entirely. You're not going to have the same responses and reactions and feelings and intensity as we would in person because it's not in person. No. Um, no, no. And then there are bad habits with online dating as well. So people sit there and they scroll because they're bored, you know, they're, or, you, if you don't meet someone quick enough and then the conversation fizzles out, um, that could be another one as well. So there's sort of like correct or, you know, good times to meet in person. Um, yeah, it, it is a really different beast. I think it's something that we need to embrace more. Obviously with COVID, it's kind of been the only thing that we can really do um, <laughs> this year. So hopefully everyone's had a bit more practice at it and, and realised that, it, it just is different to what we knew and it's even different again to what the generation before us knew. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the generation, you know, coming, theirs is probably going to be something even different. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So have you been the type of woman that will see somebody across a bar and go up and introduce yourself or have you been the type? Because I'm definitely, I freak out. I can't. Oh, yeah? I can't do it. If I see somebody across the way, and this has got to do with my self-worth, this is going to be very clear with what I'm about to say, but my initial when I'm looking at somebody and there's a smile back and a couple of, like, glances back, I'm like, oh, nah, mm-hmm. he's 
he couldn't really be interested. And then I never act on it because the fear for me would be walking over, introducing myself and not having a good pickup line to go over with. And then the fear is they'd laugh. I'll be like, uh, no. And look in South Australia, the ratio to single men and single women is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> so there's a high likelihood. I always check for the hand. I mm-hmm. always check if there's a ring finger, but a lot of guys don't wear wedding rings. Yeah. Well, look, it's even harder. I'm um, clocking someone else that's the same sex is near impossible um and since all the marriage equality stuff changed there aren't really specific gay nights like there used to be so like garage on a sunday in the city and there used to be a couple of other nights where like lesbians or gay people would gather and that would be our place to make eyes across the room at someone of the same sex but just in a general pub yeah you you know as a you just wouldn't have any idea but um back to yourself you don't need a pickup line you are fucking amazing. You're stunning. And all you got to do is walk up and say, hey, you smiled at me and I'm smiling back at you. Do you want to have a drink? Oh, that's really good. It's that simple. Yeah, make I it really simple. To, yeah. I go to this whole, I need a script. I need a rehearsal. Nah, nah. Okay. Nah. This is, this nah. is Take the chance. And I mean, The amount of, I have obviously no problems with walking up to someone and just being like, hey, you're beautiful, hot, sexy, let's have a drink, you want to have a dance. Like that's, you know, a little bit extra furthered like that. But I'm I'm not afraid of the no. Uh, Because because what you can see it as is you're complimenting them. Uh, So if you can look at it from a giving point of view and from a kindness point of view, so you've walked up to someone and said, in other words, I think you're attractive and I'd like to get to know you. And how does that make you feel when it happens to you? Pretty good most of the time. Yeah, I don't think it's it's actually ever happened. Oh, well, we should go hang out in a bar sometime. (laughs) (laughs) It's actually never happened. I think I've maybe once gone up to a guy and Mm -hmm. said, uh, paraphrasing because it was a long time ago, Mm-hmm. something to the effect of I think you might want my business card and I left my business card. Ooh, <laughs> mad flex, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked off and that was it. I love it. <laughs> love it, love it. You just got to give less fucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. Totally. Because, you know, and it comes back to the self-worth. You've got to know that you are amazing. You are beautiful. You have so much to offer. You're a creative. You know, you're obviously a beautiful person. You know the Fusco's and you've got to be a stunning human being to be in their, you know, <laughs> periphery. Shout um, out to the Fusco's. Yep. Yeah, what's up, guys? Um, but honestly, give less fucks. Take yeah. those chances. Lean into that fear. Have the year of yes. Jump out of an airplane with me next month. What? <laughs> I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can do the airline. I, 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 no, I can't do the airline. But I know so exactly I, what you're saying, Jill. Yeah, it's the rewiring of fear and your relationship with fear. Um, and then if you if you can sort of put that to one side, and then as I said, if you can look at it like you get to give that person a little pep in their step, you know, because this beautiful person has walked up to them and said, oh, you smile at me and I'm smiling at you and I think I'm into you. That's going to feel good. And if they say no, well, that's all right. There's four billion fish in the sea. This is true. And it's such Mm -hmm. a shame that we still have corona lingering around Mm. because, you know, the world is a beautiful place with lots of beautiful people Mm. to explore, you know? Mm. Oh, yes. Soon. Soon, soon, hopefully. Very, very soon. We can all get back. I mean, at least I'm hoping for fringe time anyway. Yes. An Australian uh, extravaganza this year, I think, which which I'm stoked for as well. I think um, there'll be a lot of interesting stories being told this I year in so. particular. You know, there's been a lot of interesting experiences, a lot of changes. So I'm looking forward and to I seeing think what the... Um, open also, Jill, um, the opportunity for people to see more local stuff. Oh, yeah. They would have just gone, oh, because that act is from overseas or whatever, it's got more credibility, I'll go see that. Mm-hmm. I think it will, um, hopefully, audience will be more generous with their choosing of what they go and see. Oh, absolutely. You know, maybe those big names will stay in their home states and so we'll see some of the more grassroots 
productions and artists and musicians coming out of the woodworks that we might not have normally seen. I personally am someone that picks, you know, uh, I don't go and see the, the big names. I can see them on the, you know, the Melbourne Comedy Festival or Correct. Tony and that sort of thing. So I always go and find like the weirdest, most wonderful little dive bars with these crazy shows. And I love a comedy show. Yes. So yeah, I'm super stoked. Hopefully we can all get out and, and mingle uh, yes. on that March. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I hope that's mm. how everybody looks at Fringe next year. So yeah. you've come close to Happy Ever After. Mm. Would you say that you still believe in Happy Obviously, you see it all the time. But would you say you have a fixed idea of what you hope your happy ever after is or are you open to the possibilities of whatever that might be i'm absolutely open to the possibilities of whatever that might be because it is such a unique experience between two people and those two individuals have such unique experiences in life they're both so multifaceted the languages they speak the love languages like yours physical touch your verbal language you know it takes a lot of things to line up to make a relationship start and then be successful and stay successful it yeah. takes a lot um many 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 things have to line up there's got to be your community support your family your friends you've got to know the difference between selfish and selfless you have to know that it's a continual learning journey um and that you know it's in a balance there are good days there are bad days um so for me yeah i absolutely think that one day something will come along and it will just work I don't know when it will be I don't know what it will be I'm not even sure what gender that person will be anymore but for me I have a different level of content in my life in what is my my body of work with with my sort of study on on love through my photography so as long as I get to keep doing that forever then that's pretty good yes <laughs> I love that I love yeah. that Jewel in closing is there anything we have not touched on that you would like to speak on to finish us up for today? I, do you know what? I really think we have covered a lot of things. I, I will always, always go back to the, the poetic nature of love and what that's been like throughout history. People have been telling stories of love, going to war over love. You know, they say that love is all you need. Love conquers all. Um, you know, uh, love is deeply in the brain. Our challenge is to understand each other. Mm. That's by Dr. Helen Fisher. And love is deeply in our brains. It's a part of our chemistry. But in the conscious world, in our conscious minds, we have the task of understanding one another. And that will come through vulnerability and communication, patience, mutual respect, kindness. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, that self-exploration, you've got to know who you are. And you've got to know your own language. So your own love languages and your own um, way of giving and receiving love. Fantastic. I have a right. to this, Jewel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Oh, Julia was right then. <laughs> Thank you for your time. It's been much appreciated. We have gone far and wide. It's been our absolute pleasure. I'm so happy to contribute something to the conversation of love and to your podcast, which I am absolutely bloody honoured to be a part of. I listened to Alex DePortius this morning. It was just like total fangirling. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the same podcast as Alex DePortius. Oh, wow. It's very cool. And then obviously like Carla Confessionals Cabaret, I've heard your name for years. Oh, um, really? So, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Adelaide Famous, you know, French Famous, for sure. So it's oh, been thanks, um, babe. That's so really, cool. really awesome. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Joya was right then. Thanks, Puskos win again. The Catchalorette with friends near and far, from heartache to catfish and sex toys. Ooh, ah. The Catchalorette. See you next time, if you dare. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the Planet checking account. 
It gives back 1% of the account's net revenue to the planet at no cost to you. There's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement, and there's no minimum balance required. The 1% for the planet checking account, only from Bank of the West. Learn more at bankofthewest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.